how does an investor in your company make money? And like they want to hear words like dividends and, sh and share growth and all those wonderful things. But the reality for most juniors is that doesn't happen all the time. You've got to wait for the right moment. You're in a early stage establishing yourself in country phase. You've got the model right you're telling me. And with access to more capital, you're going to be able to replicate this in country and beyond in the next two or three years. What you've done so far, is that by accident, timing, or, or, or something else? Or do you know what you're doing and can you continue to do it? Hello and welcome to Crux Investor. First of all, thank you very much for watching. And if you could give us a thumbs up, and of course, if you haven't already done so, please click the subscription button in the corner of the screen. And if you wanna go that extra mile, please leave a comment down below. And we try to get back to absolutely everyone. Anyway, today's interview is with Intercontinental Gold CEO, Gord Glenn. They have an operation down in Bolivia. Now it's a gold trading business, which is not mining per se, but it has exposure to gold. And he explains to us their business model. It's quite a small operation, four million Canadian dollars. We ask him about how he intends to get scale into the business, and he explains why. Take a look in the description below at some of the topics we discuss. And if you wanna to go to that point of the video, click the relevant timestamp, and that'll take you there. Anyway, let's hear what Gord has to say. Hello, Gord, how are you, sir? I'm great, Matthew. Thanks very much. How are you doing? Not too bad. Not too bad. Um, so we're going to hear the story of Intercontinental Gold, which is a story which not we've not really heard much about before, um, nor indeed the area in which you play. We've got gold investment without the mining risk, right? That's exactly right. I was uh, seeking seeking opportunities without the incredible risk associated with uh, your typical exploration development and even operation company operating companies cool okay why don't we kick off with the usual one minute summary and then we'll pick it up from there sure thing thanks so uh intercontinental gold is uh, quite a unique company we're a gold refining and commodity trading company mm -hmm. uh, we started up about uh, two and a half years ago uh, really a transition uh, from a, a, a traditional, typical junior exploration company, trying to find, you know, a, a business plan that kind of made sense in a in a new market paradigm, which is not a lot of investor capital for high risk, speculative drilling or or, or other exploration projects. And and my my background over you know three decades, you know, ranges from geologist by training and and uh, about 10 years in industry to uh, mining analyst to corporate banker uh, and, and financing companies. So I've seen the gambit of, of, of the good and the bad. And as I got a little older, a little more cynical, uh, you know, I was really looking for something that was low risk, but still kept me in my preferred space of mining and commo or of, of, of commodities, gold in particular. And, um, and this uh, opportunity came along and it was really an opportunity to kind of take something that wasn't really known or understood in the capital markets and, and bring it into the light, right? If, uh, we'll talk about a little bit of, about um, uh, the gold trading business, broadly speaking, in, in a minute or two. But, but this is unique in that we're the, one of the few, if not the only, uh, publicly listed gold trading slash refining company and, and offering a, a different exposure to uh, to gold and gold investment to investors. Great. Okay, I, li I like that because you're starting with an idea, with a plan, uh, as opposed to we're going to get drilling. That that, that yeah. is what I hear most of the time. Where we found it's an a, asset and we're going to drill. Right. Yeah. It's but but more it's more about the plan. So let's let's get into that. So you're right. The environment in the last three, four years, five years has not been conducive for junior miners in terms of getting funded. Okay, obvious. But you, you sound like you've, you've really done a few different things there. I, I, I didn't realize the extent of what you, you experienced. So can you just give us a little bit of your background there? You, you talked about some of the things, yeah. you know, ge 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 geologist and analyst and uh, banker, etc. How did that all come about? Yeah, <laughs> um, happenstance planning. I don't. I don't know. Some days, um, I, uh, geologist by training, spent ten years in industry with medium-sized companies. Um, you know, so not not promotional stuff. I'm really a. I, 
I characterize myself as a drill to kill geologist, ec economic geologist. I'm not there for, uh, you know, small things. I'm looking for big, uh, big opportunities. When I was a geo, again, bigger companies, um, you know, really having a plan, uh, executing on that plan. And if it wasn't sizing up, then, you know, the, the plan changed and you moved on to other projects that were, you know, in the pipeline. Uh, eventually, um, this is now in the 90s, I guess, uh, you know, got onto uh, Bay Street uh, uh, at the time, uh, you know, became a, a mining associate and a mining analyst at a bunch of different firms, ranging from, you know, the old Grivis McBurney and partners, if you can, you know, remember the, you know, uh, start of an independent, uh, high profile uh, brokerage firm and, and evolved right up through to RBC Capital Markets. I've, I've analyzed gold to, uh, bulk commodities to uranium to, to you name it, uh, pretty much everything. So pretty comfortable in the in the world of analyzing commodities, analyzing uh, mining assets, early stage right through to, you know, full on, fully integrated um, companies. Uh, you know, I used to cover Alcan, I used to cover Inco, Falconbridge, like big diversified uh, companies. Um, eventually, uh, you know, again, evolved into the, call it the dark side of, of mining investment banking with, mm. with bank owned firms, TV Securities, Desjardins, uh, and, and helped companies, uh, you know, advance their projects, finance their projects, you know, put in place strategies for either, either M&A, outright M&A, uh, or, or otherwise just try to help them manage their business better and might be might just be simple you know adding capital to the business but uh, i'd like to think more often uh, was about providing them feedback and guidance on, okay. on where they should focus okay so we, we got a bit we've got a bit of um geology ge geological background we've got a bit of finance background there you talked about looking for big opportunities this is not a big opportunity a small company three and a half four million bucks depending on what day of the week it is but without the mining risk, which answers the question which you had asked yourself, which was how do we get something funded in this market? So yeah. how did this come about? Yeah. What did they what did they come to you and say? And in fact, who was they? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll challenge you on the small opportunity. It's it's small today because we're just that's what I said. really getting going. Fair, fair enough. Uh, you know, so I, I sort of semi-retired from, from from investment banking back in 2012, and I was really just intending this to sit on boards, do my own thing, help companies do what they need to do from a from a board uh, level, advisory level. Um, one of the companies that I was on the board of, uh, I really just threw up my arms after a year or so and just said, "Enough is enough, guys." Uh, you know, small uh, in, in in good faith with the with the you know with the board's um, you know feedback and and ultimately their acceptance that in, enough in this market which is there's very little capital enough of these little um, tiny little deals to drill very high risk exploration holes uh, it might be valid technical targets and I I do have enough of a background to have a, a positive view on a good valid technical target but I also have. 25 years of financing and analyzing risk and it, it, it just wasn't computing for me so i i just uh, proposed to the board let me let me take control of the company and i'm going to find an asset and and i was looking independently of that just personally i got introduced some to some guys down in bolivia uh gold traders uh exporters and at, initially they were just looking for for my capital to invest in them and I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. I've never seen this. I've seen every project, every mine, every development story under the sun over my over my career, I would like to think. And this is new. I haven't talked to a gold trader before, a gold mm -hmm. exporter before. So I put on my banker hat and I thought I was going to Swiss cheese them. And uh, as it turned out, I was pretty intrigued. And, and, and the origin of this is in Bolivia, of all places, which all which has its own red yellow flags that, that, that uh, crop up due to some past um, uh, nationalizations that went on uh, in the early 2000s uh, anyways to get to the point i like what they said i like that the um that the bolivian um, mining and exploration um, environment was really highly regulated and it was really geared around small miners right, right. Um, but what so did they I say tell, tell me about what they said you, i like you, i liked what they said what was the thing they said as opposed to what you oh, could see in country 
Yeah, well, the, what they what they said was that uh, you know for a hundred grand we can we can basically double the size or triple the size of the company that they were working with at that time, a little company called Goldway uh, SRL. And Goldway today is a wholly owned subsidiary of Intercontinental Gold. Um, what that that business plan is really about uh, rotating your working capital. So what intrigued me was that after I'll say I can say decades now of financing small exploration, massive exploration, small development, massive development stage companies. I was sort of getting tired of companies missing their numbers and using mm -hmm. incredible amounts of capital. And and sometimes there was remorse and sometimes when they missed and sometimes there wasn't remorse. It was, oh, well, um, let's just let's just go back over the hill. That sort of classic geology um, you know, let's refocus and change our business plan and, and, and okay. move on. Let, can we ex and explain explain to me because I think it's really important. We got to get we got to get into this, explain to people how this works. What's the mechanism? What's the process? So we're talking about trading here, and you used a great phrase there, rotating your capital. Okay, which suggests yeah. that you can turn your money quicker. So explain what the basic premise of a, of the trading business that you're in. What does it do? Yeah, so pretty straightforward. You have licensed uh, formal um, uh, small miners, artisanal miners, small miners. Uh, you basically call them up every day and say, I have money, come on in, bring your gold, you buy it. So there's a, there's a, there's a physical process there where you weigh it, then you, you melt it down again and, uh, and, and value it, right? right. XRF gun assay uh and then you and then in this case and this is what i really liked about this business i don't take risk with my investors capital with the company's capital we buy it and we sell it all within the span of 30 minutes to an hour all hey, right very interesting no risk very interesting okay so unlike your typical mining process which can take days weeks months quarters depending yeah. on the commodity that you're in i loved a business model that was sort of had a retail -y element to it where it's like the transaction is done in you know within a very short period of time and then you and then you export the product legally uh, so that's what got my attention and I kept thinking back to the days and my again the early days when I was in the uh, back in the sell side on the brokerage business and, and I'll specifically reference um, Burvis McBurney and partners because the analysts and associates used to sit around the trading desk. So we would hear the Mike Weckerleys and the and, and the bonds and all those guys yelling out stuff off the desk and they were buying and selling stock for their clients. The morning meeting would be here's the ideas of the day they would hit the desk and they would call the clients. Here's the idea. You know, I want you to buy this stock. Here's why. Sometimes they would put capital, the capital on the desk to work, churning working mm. capital yep. to clip that small coupon. So the point is, is that the, the there's an analogy here between the gold trading business and a traditional brokerage trading desk, where you're not taking risk. Mm. You're you know your seller and you know your buyer. Yeah. You put those together very right. quickly. You, you put capital on the table, but for a very short period of time. And just like in the tr the equity trading business, or at least what I used to remember it to be, you take that little clip, that little coupon on each and every ounce. Right. Well, let, let, let's let's break that down, okay? Because um, that's great, unless you do one trade a day, in which case it, it's not so good. How do you get scale into this business? Because there's so many well, you, artisanal and small scale miners out there where you are at. Yeah. It's quite labor intensive to get those relationships going, get them to trust you and turn up at your door versus someone else's door. If you've got cash, they're listening, I guess. Um, but yeah. how much of a margin are you taking, first of all? Just to understand uh, that. It's about a one, it, it's about, okay, so we're very transparent. Everything is in our financial statements if you have, if you read through them. Thank you. It's about a 1%, 1% gross margin on the trade. Okay. So we always make money on the trade. And anybody that tells you that there's, you know, big margins to be made in gold trading and and, and refining and exporting, um, they're they're probably illegal, uh, or they don't know what they're talking about. Probably it's a pro low pro margin, high volume business. Pr probably the latter. Um. All right. So how much are you rotating? How much are you turning over? And where are you in this? Because I know it's relatively young, but you know you've been going long enough now to you know 
have got known. So how are you going to ramp this thing up? Because it was a new business and I was using my money and other people's money, I didn't want to I didn't want to overcapitalize the business because what if something went wrong? So I really had round one, round two of show me and then grow me money, initial results. Mm -hmm. And I think from from the financial results, and you can see this in our in our very public uh, disclosure that we've achieved, you know, pretty significant triple digit growth on on many um, uh, top line me top line metrics, volumes, revenues. And then really in the, about the third quarter of last year, we started to become, you know, operating profitable, profitably, like or positive earnings, two cents in earnings, I think we reported. Um, and, and it gets to scale, right? So you put more money in, you rotate it fast, fast, right? Right now, we probably have rotation of about 100 times plus per year on our money, right? So working with 3 million Canadian dollars, not very much. Mm -hmm. We'll do over we'll do over three hundred million dollars in top line revenue in two thousand nineteen. Um, that's how you do it. Add okay. more money, and it's direct drive. It hits the financial statements that month, that quarter, that 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 period. So it's a it's a really a churn business. Volume is key. Our costs are for the most part fixed. And then there's the other aspect of what we do. Matthew, which is important because it goes to risk, right? Mm -hmm. I don't like taking risk. Um, it was a long-term plan to build the refinery um, and, and produce a, a four nines refined bullion product uh, for follow-on steps. Consider Intercontinental's first step to be the first building block, and then we can expand off of our refined production in the future. But you also reduce risk by selling a four nines bullion. Mo majority of small miners produce a Dore product, could be 70% gold, 95% gold. The, the point is, is that, that uh, when we buy it and we value it based on a weight and a grade, and then we export it and we expect to get paid very quickly from the, from the off taker or refiner in, in those days, um, you can easily uh, be be told that oh it wasn't 10, 10 kilos it was nine point eight kilos and it wasn't yeah. ninety five percent gold and because of the velocity of gold is so fast you have zero recourse right other than yeah. to stop dealing with with those particular people okay so, so selling refined it, it reduces our risk okay un un understood so I, I know I was going to ask you what what are the barriers for this growth and, and this and this scale so um, I'm going to assume you have lots of relationships in country and you've got a great team and everyone knows you and I'm going to assume that the the refining process you, you've got nailed down um, but the, the the main barrier to this is the size of the opportunity in in Mar is that beeping is your investors calling you is it in the background yeah, I, probably, I can hear it probably calling. right uh, <laughs> so how, how do we get some uh, how, how do we get an understanding of what the scale is in country, and then how do you how do you build it out from from there? Right. Yeah. So we started off in Bolivia. Again, Bolivia was highly regulated. I couldn't have started this business in any other jurisdiction. Right. I wouldn't have had the 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 comfort, the legal um, comfort, the policy. Even though Bolivia at the time was a, was a um, still a socialist country, but they had a highly regulated small minor cooperative system so everybody was licensed and registered so you know with with that in place that was the, that's one key building block it's part of that stakeholder continuum as i kind of describe it so between the small miners the mining federations that we work closely with that sort of administer or or liaise between the small miners and the and the government and then there's all the government agencies that we interact with because we're that one company that provides a, a gold exporter, gold refiner that provides um, complete transparency on our transactions. Um, we conform to all the rules. We pay all the taxes. There's zero tax leakage with, with our business. That's in, that's in a stark contrast to many other trading entities that, that are out there, unless you're a very large trading company. Like our, our um, KYC is the same as a bank's, for example, because okay. we have to, our off takers, we have to deal with 
with their with their uh, extensive KYC. So we're just a continuum of that. But give me give me a sense of look. Wait, you, 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 we can look at the numbers in here, and you kind of said you know give us an idea of the scale of operation today and what you're turning over and rotating this cash. What's the opportunity in country? How bigger? How much bigger can this get in country? You're telling me there's very little competition, but that's never the case uh, if you start doing well. So. Where yeah, does this go to no, in country? Yeah, yeah, there there is competition in the country. Uh, you know what 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 we found is that um, the competition here it's 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 really weak in the sense like they're they're not formal, they're not um, they're not uh, completely legitimate. Uh, the Bolivian market alone is about a billion two uh, in sort of export value, mm -hmm. uh, so that's a pretty decent sized market. Latin America is probably plus six billion dollars in export market the global um, small artisanal mining sector which is really under service in a formal licensed way like an intercontinental is probably an 18 to 20 billion dollar business mm -hmm. they're being serviced but they're being serviced by by very small traders by very small exporters that may not be and in some cases just definitely are not fully compliant so our business, uh, like my goal right now is to get us to a billion dollars in top line revenue uh, in the next two to three years. And that is definitely possible with modest increase in our in our current operate our working capital. OK, and what does that do for you? Because again, you're turning out sound, those sounds like really, really impressive numbers. But, but the truth is you're rotating this cash. You've got small margins there. Um, you've got your, your your overhead costs, which seems to be mostly at the moment people. I, mean, I appreciate the costs will yeah. be relatively low. So, what is what is a billion bucks revenue? Are you talking about all from one country, or are you talking about having expanded into other jurisdictions? There'll be other jurisdictions right. in there as well. Okay. But I think we I think we can dominate Bolivia. That's uh, that's probably a half a billion dollars in top line revenue there. Okay. Peru is five times the size of Bolivia in terms of export volumes where we've been active in, in Peru. It's a slightly different um, uh, business model there. It's still buying, for, it's, you typically buy from toll milling operations yeah. in Peru who are supplied by small miners, licensed uh, formal small miners. Uh, there's opportunities in Colombia. Uh, and then obviously once, once we've developed our Latin American um, platform to to the fullest extent, or maybe before, uh, there's West Africa and, and Africa, right, where there's significant, you know, artisanal small mining in, in in various jurisdictions. There, it's really about having a a template, a business template that works both for 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 the company and our stakeholders and our um, you know goals in terms of profitability and expansion, but also works within the regulatory regime. Uh, of the different jurisdictions that we're in. And in some cases, we, I like to think that our business model ultimately is, is really engineered to squeeze out the competition because the competition is not as transparent. They're not as uh, compliant. And, and that really goes, that speaks well to government agencies, tax authorities that are, mm. that are constantly looking at tax leakage particularly in these jurisdictions and specifically associated with resource development. Okay, so the, 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 your three and a half, four million bucks market cap today, those are big, heady plans. And I, I guess you're saying there's a cookie cutter approach to this. I, I get that. Let's come back to today, though. Um, today, if people listen to this and go, this, this company's got something, how do I invest my money? And you can get access to capital as a result. How are you going to deploy that capital? Because it, it, again, it, it's hard to go out and get business overnight. Yeah, Is, yeah right. So, so it takes time. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, well, number one, the, what I love about this business is I don't have capex. I don't have sustaining capital of, of, of any significance, really, relative to a mining development or operating company. Working capital, new funding. It goes immediately to our top line and our bottom line. That's just that's just the way this business works because of the velocity of, of the business. As we deploy capital, uh, and let me back up. Uh, so again, part of the business plan here, and this is going back into the 90s when I was an analyst, and I'm looking at comparing this business, which if you wanted to say 
um, just strip it down, you'd go uh, tr commodity traders, especially s servicing small miners. Mm -hmm. They tend to be regionally focused, mm -hmm. right? Like a like a small office dealing with a de dealing with a specific uh, jurisdiction, um, and and they can't really grow beyond that. They're all private mom and pop situations, or in some cases a little bit bigger, a bit more professional. And I really compared it to the to the late 90s when the drilling companies, the hard rock drilling companies, which were all private, uh, they were regionally focused. They had a very good book of business in the areas that they were. I'll bring up one specific one because I, I think people will recognize the name Major Drilling, um, you know, uh, which which became a public company late 90s, early 2000s. So it took its its private business with a regional focus. Um, and they became public. And then when they became public, they were able to immediately uh, complete M&A transactions in other jurisdictions and grow very rapidly through M&A. I see a direct, a direct uh, analogy uh, with the trading business where we provide a, an exit strategy for a good owner, a good management team, and a good business that is well-established and compliant. We provide that exit strategy because here's here's a fact in the gold trading or commodity trading business if you take your money off the table your business really isn't worth anything other than the chattel right whatever you've got hanging up hanging from your walls or or the printer or the computer you've lost your sustainability so part of the business plan here is always to be looking for and at uh, other regional uh, commodity traders uh, gold traders. I can look at other commodity traders as well, and 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 basically acquire them and extend my geographic presence, extend my book of business, established business, and really just take our template to the, you know, to the to the next level. So I see lots of opportunities in that area. Um, sorry, lots of regional opportunities. Uh, the specific opportunities are harder to come by because we need to we have to. Um, you know, we're a public company. I need very. I need to, you know, ensure that that our um, uh, business is fully compliant and, 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 and sort of meets meets our internal requirements for transparency, as well as the external. So, uh, so what? Why did Why did you go public? Why Why bother? Uh, well, I was actually. <laughs> there are days when I wonder. Uh, no, in all seriousness, seriousness. Uh, look, I, I've spent uh, you know a better part of two decades in the public capital markets. I've always worked with uh, shareholders, and I was really trying to find a a vehicle and a structure that was unique and different that could offer growth, the kind of growth that mining companies typically can't deliver now i'm not talking about an exploration discovery where the stock goes you know parabolic very quickly because of it's it's exciting i'm talking mm -hmm. about quarterly financial results of a business that that uses very little capital right uh sorry does capex i shouldn't say mm -hmm. working cap working capital is one thing that uses very little capital but can but 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 is in a position in the in the continuum of resource the resource sector that it can churn it very quickly and deliver profitability, you know, ever increasing profitability. And that's why I made it a public company. And and I think half of my shareholders, you know, completely agree with that. And I sort of have a bit of a, an Amazon model in mind where I can, you know, you might start off as a very small gold exporter with very slim margins, mm -hmm. but you have a building block to, to move into other other commodities, other jurisdictions, and eventually this could become a you know a, a effectively a a, um, a digital uh, form of uh, of business. Right. So let's descri let's describe for your current shareholders and new shareholders how they make money because if I look at your share price now, it's sort of you know 20, 20 cents. It was sort of twelve cents you know a year ago. Um, it's gone up. But there's not a lot of shares, not a lot of liquidity. It's hard for people to make money. So what are, what are they buying into? Are they buying into a long-term hold because you think you can build something in the next two or three years, or do you think people can trade in and out? You know, next year, this year is going to be a lot easier for people to trade in and out of. Yeah. Well, I, I look. I, I I certainly want more liquidity in the stock. Hence, you know, more 
more um, marketing, more initiatives like this. Mm. Um, the, the flip side is I, I sort of engineered the capital structure to be tight for for a reason. I want I want to have torque and I want to have earnings per share, um, and 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 that should attract investors. The core investors that we have are are just that. I think they're pretty good long term core investors. They like what we're doing and they see a growth trajectory that can be achieve based on the quarterly yeah. results that we've achieved so far longer term uh you know i don't see anything to stop us continuing to grow the way we're going uh, there, there is access to capital out there as we as we need more capital we can attract more capital on 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 terms that make sense for everybody but, about, but i'm trying to i'm trying to get at how, how does an investor in your company make money like they want to hear words like dividends and, and share growth and all those wonderful things but the reality for most juniors is that doesn't happen all of the time you've got to wait for the right moment you know to to achieve those things so you're in a early stage establishing yourself in country phase you've got the model right you're telling me and with access to more capital you're going to be able to replicate this in country and beyond in the next two or three years, right? So that that's what I'm hearing. So I, I, I need people to understand where, what they'd be walking into here. So you're not promising them yeah. the, the, the world this year. You're saying this is getting in early to something which is, has got huge growth potential and you know what you're doing. I mean, that that's what I think you're telling me. Yeah, that's it. There, there's, there's a dividend component uh, as we continue to build up our capital base. Again, I don't want to deplete my working capital because I need to churn that uh, very actively. Um, but really, this is about growth and, and on top of growth. Like right now, we're like I said, uh, um, full year of refined production last year, 2019, over 300 million Canadian dollars. Uh, we can triple and quadruple that over the next year or two or three. And what kind of companies can get to a billion dollars in top line revenue in a couple of years after starting up? Um, there's not that many out there, I don't think. Um, and we can continue to grow. There's a $20 billion plus market out there for us to, you know, evolve into. But that's not, the, but that's not the number people are looking at. You know, that, re, re, turnover is irrelevant. It's, you know, what are the margins you're, you're creating for yourselves in terms of the deals that you're yeah. doing? What are shareholders going to get back? You know, and and you know whatever dividends you you, you may issue in the in the future, that's what they're interested in, and they want to hear from you. Are you? Is this? Have you done what you've done so far? Is that by accident, timing, or or, or something else? Or do you know what you're doing, and can you continue <laughs> to do it? Yeah. Well, it's the, it's a combination of things, as as often times these things are. Uh, look, I'm very model driven, as you can tell by my background. I've spent a lot of time modeling things out. I'm not I'm not saying that the modeling works every time, but directionally, it 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 provides the the strategy. Working with my my partners and my colleagues and the management team down in Latin America, who have you know, probably 60, 70, 80, 90 years combined experience on all aspects of, of buying, selling, refining, legally exporting, working with governments. That combination of, 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 of um, modeled plan with on the ground, like boots on the ground experience with the jurisdictions and, and our stakeholder groups in Latin America, mm. that's gonna drive our business. Right. Working capital is, is, is really the gas in the tank. The, the, the reality is, is that, is that we've got a, I'd say a, a very strong business plan that doesn't really have any impediments to growth other than lack of working capital. Um, that's about the only thing that slows us down in the jurisdictions that we're in. We're actually spending more time, more and more time as we become more established, more reputable, um, uh, that we can we can sit with the the mines minister, the tax authorities, you know, all the regulatory agents in the same room and say, here's the problems with with the industry right now. Let's fix them because it's good for you as a as a government. It's good for your tax revenues. You don't have tax leakage. And it's good for us, right? We we benefit too, and it's good for because oftentimes the tax the tax situation this is what I'm really 
like about this business is that the taxes that we pay, they ultimately make it back to the small communities where these small and artisanal miners work from. So we've been acknowledged by certainly the small miners through the Mining Federation, through the tax authorities for making that continue, we're closing the circle on that. And that gets right back to the community. So when you can you deliver a, a service like that in these jurisdictions, then I think we're doing something right. And I think that will continue to you know, benefit us going forward as we continue to grow in Bolivia, as we expand in Peru, as we seek out opportunities in, uh, in Colombia, Brazil, uh, you know, any of these Latin American uh, jurisdictions that have significant um, you know, small minor uh, gold production. Good. Thank you very much for that story. That's uh, really interesting. Like I said, we don't hear this too much. Um, sounds like you've got the beginning of something quite quite nice and you seem to have worked out how it works down there. And um, please stay in touch. Let us know how you're getting on and if indeed you can start this expansion plan of yours into other territories. That'll be really fascinating. Really fascinating. So thanks again for your time. I'll, I'll be back in touch for sure, Matthew. Thank you very much for your time and your questions.